Okay, guys, this is for the section on educational violence. Um, it's not terribly long, so hopefully we can get it through it fairly quickly. Um, as you recall, education is one of the uh, five social institutions, so we're still talking about institutional violence, and these are acts of violence committed within the people's role as educators. Um, we're going to cover bullying, um, school rape, massacre, co corporal punishment, symbolic violence, and then um, violence of educational inequality. Um, the big one here is school bullying. Um, defined as a pattern of behavior where one person with a lot of internal anger, resentment, and aggression and lacking interpersonal skills chooses to displace their aggressive onto another person. Um, that's more the psychological definition. Uh, school bullies usually operate within this myriad of social, personal problems. Um, they may have violent parent and sibling role models, um, and a, a ch um, frustrating or repressive um, childhood experience, poor anger management, impulse control, um, mass media that's violent, um, violent peers, and learning disadvantages that could have lowered their self-esteem. Um, there's different types of bullying behavior. It could be physical, um, such as assault and intimidation, um, verbal, like taunting, teasing, criticizing, um, social isolation and emotional and within the domain of the active bully is actually this web of other relationships that play a role in allowing this to continue um, there's the victim the bully um, there's this reinforcer um, all of these other people have to kind of go along with the behavior to allow it to continue. Um, boys generally are more likely to be the ones to do the physical and the verbal um, bullying with girls generally doing emotional and verbal. Um, it can be the other way around, though. Um, and then there's also um, patterns of male and female roles within the bullying um, web, which it lays out here. Um, so these are those roles. I would refer back to these um, and kind of compare. You don't need to know these for the test by any means. Um, I don't expect you to memorize them, but please be aware that these roles do exist and that there's this interconnectivity um, that allows this very social behavior to continue. Uh, between, uh, in 2014, one in three middle and high schoolers and then one in four just high schoolers um, reported having been bullied or being bullies themselves. Bullying generally is more common in middle school. Um, it peaks in late adolescence. There's more psychological, physical maturity. Um, hierarchies have already been established by this point as far as social order um, within groups and cliques and whatever. Um, so it does get better, um, but it does peak in this um, middle school time.
Um, as I said before, males are typically more physical in bullying and females are more um, subtle, indirect, um, manipulative. And this is a um, instance like a lot of other violence where um, females are more likely to bully other females and then males are males will bully either. Um, as I said earlier, bullying is connected to the hierarchical structure of social groups uh, within middle and high schools. Um, this next part just pretty much says, based on a lot of studies they did, um, violating those hierarchies made you a target for bullying and harassment. Um, they also found that other students could achieve a higher status within their groups by harassing or bullying other students um, who were considered low status. If schools reduced the hierarchies between students um, by reducing the competitive processes of it, processes of achievement, um, would there be a difference? I don't know. I think we see um, similar bullying in um, schools that enforce dress codes and um, stuff like that as well. But something to think about. Gender. Um, gender is a major element in defining the social status or the social structure of schools. Um, masculinity is constructed around um, dominant cultural discourse and ideology um, that are linked to the power relations within um, the school social structure. Uh, males who are placed in non-masculine categories um, you know, guys that are slight build, um, who are softer, um, have more, you know, quote unquote feminine qualities, um, are subject to a variety of disciplinary procedures, um, by way of bullying in order to try to keep them, uh, marginalized within the social groups. So, like any other kind of abuse, um, bullying is somewhat subjective. There's no clear distinction between victims and bullies. Um, most of the time, the bully is often the victim of current or past bullying behavior themselves, um, which suggests that bullying, you know, is a pattern. Um, it can recede later in the life in the bully's life, but the emotional effects on victims can be long lasting. And contrary to um, what some may suggest, um, you cannot really directly blame um, most teen suicides solely on bullying. Now, that's not to say that bullying doesn't contribute. Um, a lot to low self-esteem um, and stuff like that, but as far as being the you know cause and effect um, direct relationship, you can't we can't say that. Um, and as far as reducing bullying in school, um, we we can identify it. We can take steps to educate students and teachers. You can make positive steps with the bully themselves, but ultimately bullying behavior can't really be eradicated because our definition of what constitutes bullying is constantly evolving um, along with our awareness of it. Uh, 
Uh, this next bit is in regards to sexual assault in schools. Um, it occurs at all levels of education in the U.S. Most of the violence occurs between students at the high school and college levels. Um, between 20 to 25 percent of college women report surviving rape or attempted rape by the time they graduate. Most victims are women. Um, the numbers of young men claiming to be rape victims are in the very low single digits. Um, as with general rape statistics, uh, most victims uh, previously knew their attackers. Most of the um, perpetrator victim relationships um, were student on student assaults but some did include um, teacher on student. The dominant pattern, um, as with other types, is um, male more than female instructors engaged in statutory rape with young females, um, which is the nonviolent, non-coercive um, just under the age of consent. Um, are more frequent. Um, here we see two such teachers. Um, the gentleman on the bottom was a teacher and basketball coach. Uh, he was arrested for forcible sex abuse and rape of a student. Um, the female teacher was charged with rape um, after um, taking some students to her home um, and having sex with them. Both still constitute rape. Um, and I want to, before we move on, um, point out that while, you know, either it doesn't matter if it's the female teacher or the male teacher, um, this is still a teacher that's in a position of power and that in and of itself, um, is a coercive position. Um, so even if it may seem consensual, um, it is still an adult in a position of power taking advantage of said position within the educational system to prey upon said student. So, um, you know, and also be aware if you're not already of the obvious gender bias um, where this comes from. Uh, if you've never seen a case like this posted on social media, um, generally if it's a male teacher, it's, oh, this guy is, you know, a monster. This is awful. I can't believe he's, you know, doing this to these girls, blah, blah, blah. If it's a female teacher, it's generally, oh, you know, it's a... Uh, where was she at when I was in school kind of jokes. Um, it's still abuse. It's still inappropriate. It's still a person in a position of power taking advantage of a student. So I digress. Anyway, um, the next section is on school shootings slash massacres. Um, there were 445 school shootings in the U.S. between 2000 and 2010. Uh, 2000 and 2000, or 2006 and 7 had the highest number with fatalities at 66. Um, 
for colleges and universities alone, between 1990-2008, there were 14 incidents of multiple fatality shootings. That's not victims. That's 14 separate incidents. Um, it's been happening a lot more frequently, guys. Um, so not all acts of violence in schools involve students shooting students. Um, principals, janitors, teachers, guidance counselors, um, all these people have been victims. Um, school shootings um, are not unique to North America, um, though I, they, they do happen and we definitely see them more often. Um, it's not a unique thing to the United States. Um, school shootings are not a unique modern phenomenon either. Um, most shootings are committed by males. Um, that is definitely a dominant pattern. Um, and school massacres generally is the terminology used um, as it's more accurate um, since worldwide an enormous amount of educational violence involves weapons other than firearms. But in the U.S., that's what we see. And we're looking more at broad patterns, not just what we're seeing. Um, motives. There's so many different motives that, um, that people have pointed to. Um, anger and resent resentment. Um narcissism, you know, punitive styles of, uh, discipline, popular culture. Um, there's no single universal motive for inspiring these kinds of attacks. They go anywhere from irrational rage to frustration, vendettas, um, there's a gauntlet of reasons, um, and motives. Um, there's no one single, um, thing that you can point to though. Um, so who's at risk for engaging in this kind of stuff? Um, having a history of violence, drug and alcohol use, um, delinquent, peer groups, poor family functioning, poor grades, poverty. Um, but keep in mind that for all youth homicides, less than 2% occur at school. And that hasn't really changed. They may be occurring in spurts um, that are more visible through the media. Um, but kids are killed in schools every day in the U.S. It just doesn't always make the news. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, homicides at school. And like I said, these aren't just school shootings. These are you know, a kid gets stabbed at school, a kid gets shot at school by another student, or something like that. It's not always this big um, event where there's multiple fatalities. Um, you can see there's suicides here, there's homicides, um, and then the number um, of deaths above it. So the top number is the number, the black line is the number of deaths. Green is the homicides of youth ages 5 through 18. And then the light green at the bottom is the suicide of youth at school. Um... 
since this is about the institutions, the importance of the institutional context, um, we're not going to understand institutional violence unless you understand how the violence occurs as a result of the position and the roles that the people play within that organization. The violence would not have occurred if it was not for the position and role behavior. Um, there's either something about the nature of what is going on at the school in terms of social relations within or something about it as a suitable target for events outside of the organization that make it an appropriate target. So there's something about the institution. Um, corporal punishment officially defined as the physical punishment of students for various reasons. <laughs> um, depending on where you went to school, you know, that could be a, a paddle, it could be a ruler, it could be a slap on the hand. Um, there's various, um, various methods. Um, it's legal in 20 states. Um, southern states, it's very popular, um, but it is declining in prevalence. Um, the Human Rights Watch and ACLU found that during the... Uh, uh, I know this is a bit dated, 2006-2007, um, over 223,000 students received corporal punishment at least once. Um, 106 countries have outlawed this. Obviously, the U.S. is not one of them. Um, if you'd like to see this lovely map up here, you can find out um, where this is legal. You'll notice that Indiana is uh, red. Um, there's actually a paper a consent form, I believe, that you're given at the beginning of the school year. It's snuck into the uh, handbook that allows you to opt in or opt out of corporal punishment. Um, I was very interested to see that um, in my student handbook for my middle schooler. So um, if you have kids or you plan on having kids or you know somebody that has kids, you might want to have them check into that because if they don't know what they signed up for, they may be surprised. Symbolic violence in the school context. Um, is the systematic and deliberate destruction of a student's ethnic, racial, familial, or religious identity by the school um, in its most powerful form leads to genocide. Um, Violence was a result of the exclusion of the knowledge of the dominated and their resultant marginaliz marginalization within their own communities and by the larger society. Um, the most spectacular cases were within the United States and Canada and involved the Native Americans, um, American Indians, and Aboriginal populations. The systematic removal of American Indian youth, males and females from their tribal homes and placed in quote-unquote Indian residential schools um, 
began in the 1890s after conquest of indigenous people. Um, the guy that created the school system said, kill the Indian, save the man. Um, and you can kind of see these side by sides. Um, this is the same gentleman here at the bottom. These are the same kiddos up at the top after they've been um, stripped of their um, heritage and culture. The, uh, fo the forced assimilation of Native American kids in these total institutions followed uh, three stages. Um, after their capture from their homes, they were brought to the school, stripped of their clothing, artifacts, cut their hair. Um, then they were homogenized or homogenizing the group into one for the purpose of assimilation. Um, after they'd been stripped, they were given uniforms. Um, and were not allowed to speak their native language, perform any rituals or acts that were considered um, part of their culture. And then once all of this was done, they'd been stripped of their former lives and identities. Um, they were then subject to a form of assimilation that taught them the new culture and punished severely any attempt of preserving or practicing their own um, culture. So they bring them in, they change what they look like, they cut their hair, they take all their stuff, they put them in a uniform, force them to speak a different language, and then punish them for any attempts at using culture or language or any other previous um, heritage type of thing. Um, Churchill described a psychological dysfunction um, that's been referred to as RSS or residential school syndrome. Um, the symptoms are similar to those of uh, rape, domestic violence, and child abuse victims. The last residential school was not closed until 1996. And that one was in Canada. Um, Yes, ni not 1976, not 1986, but 1996. Um, the ones in the U.S., most of them were closed in shortly after 1935 um, when um, there was an Indian reorganization. There are eight off-reservation off boarding schools Um and you can follow this link if you wish. Um, it's not required um, to see something about those. Um, the next section is on violence of educational inequality. Um, the manner in which educational resources are distributed within countries, um, within states around the world is that those who enter schools with more culture or material resources either because of class, gender, ethnic position, income, wealth, whatever um, will also get more school resources through their education. So wherever you walk in that's what you're going to get out of it. So if you're already, you know, ahead of the game, you have a lot of resources going for you, you're going to get even more resources through the school. If you walk into school where you're like, you know what, my family doesn't have squat. Um, 
I don't really have a lot going for me as far as resources, you're not really going to get a whole heck of a lot at school either. Um, and that's throughout the span of their education. It's not just one class. It's not just one year. It's just not just one type of school. <clears throat> um, education in the U.S. is class and ethnically segregated. I don't know if anybody noticed this. Um, almost 75% of black and Hispanic students in the U.S. attend schools that are mostly minority populated. Um, you don't see a lot of equally mixed diversity within the schools. Um, and a lot of that is because of where the schools are located. It's because of how districting is done. Um, you know, this ties in with, you know, home prices, um, what families are able to live in certain school districts, um, access to resources within those school districts. A lot of money for schools comes from taxes. If you have a lot of wealthy people in the area, you can tax them and take that money and put into the schools. If you don't have a lot of money in the area, you're not going to get a lot of tax money to put into the schools. Um, and then class and ethnic segregation in schools is even more pronounced when you add private schools. Um, this is an interesting thing. I would suggest everyone read through it. Um, this is about two schools here in Indiana. Um, one's in Lafayette or in Hammond and the other one is in Carmel. Um, and they're only three hours away from each other and they're on I-65. So this school in Hammond, um, the medium income is 10 grand, um, 75% of families are single mothers. 98% are eligible for free or reduced price meals. Majority are minority groups, um, African American, Hispanic. There's a lot of um, kiddos who are behind um, when they start kindergarten. Um, due to not having, you know, the preschool education, stuff like that. Um, only 45% of the kids pass the state mandated, um, you know, fill in the bubble test. Um, so that's one school. And then we look at the other one. This one's in Carmel. Um, median household income, 138000 It's the highest in the state. Um, majority are white non-Hispanics, two-tenths of one percent are receiving public assistance, um, and only seven percent rent their homes. So most of these are homeowners, most of these are independent, not taking any kind of, um, public assistance. Teachers are paid 12 percent more than other teachers in the other schools. 90% um, of the students pass the state tests. Um, so, I mean, just looking at that, which school would you rather go to? I mean, you have school one. Yeah, it looks nice enough. It's kind of bland. Looks like it's a little old. Um, it was built in 1956, renovated in 1971. This one was built in 2004. It's got a lot of windows. It's very open looking. Um, so which one would you rather send your kid to? And there's nothing wrong with in admitting that you'd rather send your kid to the nicer school. There's more resources. The teachers are paid better. The classrooms are probably smaller. Um, there's more resources. Um, so let's take a step back and look at where this inequality starts. 
The process of unequal distribution of resources begins with the positions that you're born into. This is the gender, ethnic, and class situation. Um, patterns of disparity vary in terms of the level of development of the society and the social policies related to inequality. Um, 2015 census data, um, the 10 states with the lowest percentage of poor students gave their students on average 25% more in per student funding. So if you have no poor kids, you're giving each kid 25% more than the states with higher percentages of poor kids, which turns out to actually be a difference of about $3,000 per kid. $3,000 is a lot of money for one school year. That's the difference between having a textbook and having a MacBook. That's the difference between having after school programs. That's the difference between having healthier meals at lunch. That's the difference in having smaller or larger classrooms, after school tutoring, better teacher-student interaction. If a teacher is paid better, she is going to be a lot more tolerant when it comes to dealing with the student. That's pencils, that's pens, that's computer labs, that's science and technology classes. These are all of the tools that are required to get ahead in school, to get ahead in your education, and to have a better chance in succeeding in college. And the kids who need the most help are not getting it. Right here, we're going to take a look at this map on the left versus this map on the right. See if you can spot it. This is funding versus the grades that the kids get. If you notice the dark green, that's where they're spent um, that's where they're spending the money. And then if you see the blue, that's where they're getting the good grades. So the more money you invest in kids, the better grades they're gonna get. If you're not spending the money, the kids aren't learning. They're not given the opportunity. Poor, less developed countries generally have the greatest disparities in terms of position and access to schools. Um, UNICEF reports that only 60% of kids of the appropriate age attend secondary schools worldwide. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the world's poorest region, the number drops to only a quarter. They estimate that, in general, the number of out-of-school kids in the world is 93 million, and the majority are girls, and almost 80% live in Sub-Saharan and South Asia. So you can see the countries and regions listed, and then the number of kiddos that are attending secondary school. And I'll add that secondary school isn't college. Secondary school is middle school, high school. Um, so what's the effect of this inequality? What does it matter? Why do we care? Um, the differences in educational opportunity, quality, translates into differences in life chances. According to research, the effect on education on your life, um, especially within the United States, is that better educated people have um, lower morbidity rates from 
acute and chronic disease. And these are completely independent than basic demographic and labor market factors. So this is accounting for all other differences aside. Um, given the, the centrality of education in modern society, those who don't have access to the experience that a life of less quality hardship, um, you get earlier onset disease, death, um, the, the actions and institutionalized practices that deny those who need it the most can be described as an act of violence. We are disenfranchising people that are poor and don't have resources by not providing them an education that will allow them to get a better job, that will allow them to go to college, that will allow them to compete in our market. Um, so conclusions, um, the acts of violence that occur in the institu uh, educational institution are um, sometimes a matter of school policy, such as corporal punishment and symbolic violence, or a result of unequal allocation of school resources. They can also be, be an abusive position of authority. This is rape, assault, murder. Um, in some cases, they were a response to students' experience um, in the case of bullying. Um, what they all have in common is that the actors, these are the, the people doing the committing the violence, were occupying positions within the organization that are functioning to educate people. The institution and organizational context is central to the occurrence of violence. If you're not in that position, you can't commit the act or you're not as likely to commit the act. So that's it for educational violence. Um, there's been lots of opportunity. Um, I won't say lots of opportunity. Um, there are several incidents of educational violence, which would be appropriate um, if you're doing institutional violence for your case study and are interested. Um, there's been several well-documented cases of bullying, um, of um, school massacres, um, or even um, single incidents of um, attacks on between one student and another student, um, both locally and um, across the U.S. that would be um, appropriate for a case study. So um, if you have questions, again, um, send me an email, post to the Blackboard. Um, if you have questions on your case study, um, please also feel free to ask. Um, if you need feedback, as long as you give me enough time before the due date, I can provide feedback. Um, I won't tell you specifically what you're doing wrong, but I will try to guide you in the correct what, um, the correct direction. Um, so, have a good one.